All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for coming out to lecture eight amid the freezing weather. Um, if I woke up this morning, it was like three degrees on my phone. I was, oh my God, can't bike today. Um, okay, so, so today's lecture is going to be looking at some of the kind of early history of um, convolutional neural network architectures that were very prevalent in the image classification, image net challenges. Um, and that are still used very much uh, even in modern architectures. Um, and so we're going to kind of like in going through the history of them, we'll get some sense about some build some intuition about how we can design architectures and build in some of the um, some of the knowledge that we have for some of our problem spaces and then balancing trade offs among like efficiency versus um, uh, like representation and accuracy. Um, but before we get into that, a few administrative updates. So the first one with regards to office hours. Um, so this is going to be, so this schedule is up on the homepage of the website, and this is likely what the schedule is going to look like moving forward. So the only change from this is that instead of having my Friday morning office hours, instead what I've done is just make official what were previously the informal office hours that were following lectures or discussions. So, um, so if you stick around after lectures or discussions, I will stick around too to answer any questions that you have. Don't treat like the hour blocks though is like that I'll stay here until 6.30 on a Friday night. It's just like, but if people are still here, I'll stay. But um, if you wanna join on Zoom, try to join earlier so that you still catch me. Um, but so that's a small change. Um, other administrative updates, project two was released last week. Instructions are on the website. You should have gotten an email from me yesterday that the starter code now is gonna be hosted on a, Google Drive um, with a Google Drive link. So if you see that email, there's a Google Drive link. The reason for that is because our collaborating institution in Minnesota is about two weeks behind us. And so inadvertently, there's partial solutions to project one in project two. And so um, some of their students, the ambitions, the ambitious ones were actually like downloading our starter code ahead of time and getting the solutions. Um, okay, so, so that's one update. The, so the, the core of this project is going to be implementing a two-layer neural network and then generalizing your implementation to work on fully connected networks of, um, I mean, we have fixed depth, but you could, in, in theory, uh, generalize it to arbitrary depth, fully connected networks. The auto grader is still, um, is still not up. It'll hopefully be up sort of by the end of tonight. We'll say late tonight. Um, so I'll send an, an email update once that's officially online. But once again, we have like built-in unit testing throughout. So... By now, I think we've worked out some of the kinks uh, with the auto-grading PyTorch data structures. So hopefully we won't run into any with this one, but we'll see. Um, the, the due date is uh, still more than a week away, but on this project, I would really recommend starting early because the you're gonna need a GPU really to train these, these networks. Um, the training on a CPU will just be, I think, too slow. So um, I would recommend starting early so that you can make as much use of your collab limits as possible if you're going to develop on collab. With that, and feel free to stop me if there's administrative questions along the way. Um, the one other topic that I just wanted to mention before we get into the subject matter for today's lecture is on the final project. So at the end of last lecture, we talked a bit of, um, kind of more formalizing what, the, what to expect in the, final, in the final project. So this is a research-oriented final project. It'll be a team-based project for groups from one to three people. Um, and so if for some of those details, I'd refer back to, to the last lecture. But in addition, what was opened up on Friday, just at the start of discussion section, is this paper selection survey. So if you go into Gradescope, you'll see um, you'll see that there's this open quiz that's open until this coming Friday night, February 3rd at 11:59 p.m. And we're calling like this is falling under one of the 16 quizzes. So this is worth one percent of the of the grade. Uh, but the purpose of this is just to gauge your interests, your areas of interest. So there's no time limit on this quiz or this survey. Um, it just asks you like what your preferred area from the from the set of, to of topic areas that we have for the final project is. What's your second preference, third preference? Do you have specific classmates that you'd like to work with on a team? Um, I think there's a few other questions. If, is there one specific paper that you're most interested in presenting on? Um, so, so this is just to gauge which paper you'd be doing for the for the paper review and the paper presentation. This you don't necessarily have to do the the, um, the coding or like the implementation portion of the project on the same paper that you'll select in this survey. Um, but before we kind of move on, any, any administrative questions that I can 
answer or clarify. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's get into uh, CNN architectures. So as a brief recap, uh, last lecture, what we were looking at was the, the kind of building blocks, the, these component building blocks of convolutional neural networks. So in some of the past lectures, we had looked at fully connected layers, and then we saw how activation functions were needed to start to model nonlinear decision boundaries. Um, and then in last lecture, we really focused on convolutional layers, pooling layers, and then we left off with just a very brief um, kind of treatment of batch normalization. So before we get into some of the historical trends in CNN architectures, I do want to talk a little bit more about batch normalization, um, just to give more concrete um, description of what it's doing and some intuition. Um, but there's a big caveat with this discussion of batch normalization and the other normalization techniques, which is that we still don't have very good theory for why these are useful, but they're very useful. So they're good to know about on the practical standpoint, because uh, I would say pretty much every neural network that you implement or that you use will have some form of normalization in them. Um, and it's interesting from the theory standpoint, if you're interested in going in that direction, but there's still not really a good answer for why these are so useful, but they, but they very much are. So what do they do? Well, they try to make optimization easier for our neural networks. And so the, the thing to think about about why optimization might be difficult for our neural networks is if we just think about maybe like a single layer to start with. So let's say that we have this function, y is the just like the, the matrix vector multiply between our learned parameter matrix w and some input vector x. And let's consider a couple of cases. So like the first one is, let's say that the inputs to this function are not centered around zero. So maybe like the inputs are very, very far away from zero. So in that case, it's possible that a small change in our weight matrix, which would be, which would be happening during optimization, can cause a really, really, really big change in our output values, just by the fact that the distribution of the data, the input X, is very far away from, from zero, right? So just based on that, like that could maybe be one challenge for our optimization algorithms, is like you might have, to change the weight matrix by an like an extraordinarily small amount in order to kind of keep your optimization stable and not have like these really big swings in the parameter values. Um, and an additional then issue is like, let's consider the case where maybe, maybe the individual elements in this vector X have different dynamic ranges. So maybe like the first element of the vector X tends to be centered around like a very small range of values, maybe from like zero to 0 0.1. But then the second element in the vector X maybe has ranges that are between zero and a million. So now all of a sudden, like those different dimensions of the X um, are going to correspondingly cause our optimization to try to find a different dynamic range for the corresponding elements in the weight matrix W. And so that can again be an issue during optimization in that you can have like along these different dimensions of your parameter vector, you can have huge gradients going in along different directions. Um, and so that can cause again, like some, some instability during training and some, some difficulty. And so the, the, the core idea behind batch normalization is we're going to try and scale at every single layer of our networks. We're going to try and scale the input distribution to ensure that it's sort of centered nicely in a way that our networks can learn um, more efficiently. And so batch normalization is one particular form of, of normalization that tries to achieve that. And so what it is going to try and do is it's going to try and normalize the inputs of every single layer so that they have zero mean and univariance. And so to do that, you would apply this function here. So if you have your input vector, let's say X, what you'll do is you'll measure first the, the mean, the expected value along each dimension of the vector X. You'll subtract that mean from this input X. And so that's gonna now shift your data distribution so that this, this shifted X minus the mean is gonna be centered on zero on, on average. And then if we divide by the uh, standard deviation, we'll ensure that we have you know, unit variance for this resulting X hat vector. Um, and so one thing that's worth noting is that this function here is actually differentiable, right? So we have a subtraction operation, we have a division with a square root, and then the variance is also, like the calculation for variance and, and expectation are differentiable. So what that means is if we inserted this into our networks, uh, like let's say every single time we have uh, some fully connected layer, we insert batch norm first to center the data, we could still apply back propagation through that overall architecture. So we could start to train our networks with this, with this shift in distribution. Um, and so, so to kind of visualize what this is doing, let's say that we have some 2D input to our, to our networks. Let's say we have a, a batch of size N. So this vertical dimension is the, the N examples. And then each one of those examples, let's say is a column vector 
of dimension D, or in this matrix here, it's a, a row vector. So what batch normalization is going to do is it's going to try to normalize element-wise along your, your, your channels or like this dimension D. So it's going to take, so, so to calculate first like the mean along each of those dimensions, you're going to sum across every single element in your batch, so all of the N uh, elements, and then you're going to divide by the total number of elements in the batch. And that'll give you your mean for every single channel along the dimension D. So then what you would do in, in, your, in your overall equation is if you're going to try and center one of the elements of the input, you'll just subtract the corresponding mean from one of the channels along the dimension D. So then correspondingly, you would calculate the, um, the variance using like the standard, uh, or sorry, in this case, yeah, uh, this is the standard deviation. And then you'll divide after you subtracted the mean from every single channel of your input, you'll then divide correspondingly by the standard deviation. Um, well, one thing we do is like you'll add a small epsilon in practice to ensure that you don't have a division by zero. So you wouldn't have like a numerical overflow or, or underflow issue. Um, and so that's how batch normalization is defined. So this you could directly go and like take these equations and, and implement. Um, and so the like one important detail then is to, is to sort of realize that the, the normalized output X, let's say X hat is actually the exact same shape as the input. So it'll still be N uh, examples in your batch, and each of those is still going to be a row vector of, si of dimension D. So this is how it's defined. Um, the one kind of thing, though, that might be an issue is we're going to potentially, in the way that it's defined here, we're going to be losing information about, for each of these dimensions that we're normalizing, where was the original mean? Like, where was the original center of that distribution? And also the scale information, right? So we're all, because we're now going to be scaling it down to this univariance, which hopefully will make optimization easier, you're, you are potentially losing some information. So an idea that was proposed to, to go along with batch normalization is to add two learnable parameters, pr parameters to gamma and beta here, which are meant to allow this overall transformation to still represent like an identity function. So the, the high level thinking is, okay, if we add these additional parameters, we're gonna reduce the constraint that batch normalization is gonna force all the inputs to be zero mean and univariance, but still allow batch normalization to potentially try to normalize the input if it thinks that that's, if, if the optimization finds that that's useful for minimizing the loss. So in other words, so what these gamma and beta parameters are doing is sort of adding additional flexibility to this layer so that we're not putting too hard of a constraint on the, on the um, optimization problem. It's very hand wavy because this theory is like, there's not still concrete theory about why this works, but we'll get to how, how well it works. Question? Yes. So batch normalization. So the question was, do, if we're introducing, was it if we're introducing gamma and beta, or this overall? If we're introducing just the gamma and beta, um, it will. Yeah, so yes. So if you, I mean, so depending on what gamma and beta are, that's going to control how this shifting of the distribution occurs. So if gamma is exactly equal to your standard deviation and beta is exactly equal to your to your original mean, so your original standard deviation and original mean, then effectively this transformation will do nothing. It'll be the identity transformation. But if gamma and beta are not the standard deviation and the mean respectively, then yes, they're going to be changing where this scale distribution lies in the in the space of of your of your data set. So they are um, they're tunable parameters. And in practice, gamma and beta will pretty much never be the original standard deviation and mean. I mean, I, so it's, it's um, in theory, you can model the identity transformation, but in practice, batch normalization never choose to actually, well, unless you can, I mean, you could probably create some contrived example where it does, but in practice on like image classification, batch normalization will actually rescale and shift the, the distribution away from its original um, like location in, in the space. Yeah, 
so the question was if 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 gamma and beta let's say are initialized randomly which in which generally they are uh, then then won't you be let's say changing the distribution of the data and how your optimization know that that's hap like that that's occurring and try and take that into account um that's a great theoretical question that there's not from my understanding an answer to but in practice this is this will make optimization uh converge much much faster um so that's an interesting direction to look at in like the literature to see what the current um, ideas that have been proposed to, to describe that on. Um, so one, one like an additional thing that we should think about, in addition to like this broad question, which we're not going to answer about like how to, what is actually, how does this work? Um, what, why is it effective? Is that the way we've defined these, these batches of, or the, the way we've defined this mean and this, um, and this standard deviation right now are dependent on the specific mini batch of data. So it's, in other words, both these calculations are dependent on the specific N that we're performing the summation over. So if every single time you have a different batch of data during stochastic gradient descent, you're gonna calculate a different mean and a different standard deviation for that specific batch. So what that implies is like, if we wanna apply this batch normalization layer at test time, we might not be able to do that um, in part because we might have, let's say a test time batch of size one, um, in which case, the 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 equip like the um the 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 batch normalization layer is going to break and and in addition we might have cases where at test time we're not going to have batches that we're feeding into our network that were sampled in the same sampling regime as we use during training so instead like you might imagine deploying this system let's say like you're going to deploy it you're going to deploy a neural network on a robot where the batches that it's going to be taking in are based on where the robot is localized at that specific time. So maybe you won't just feed it in one example, but you still maybe feed it in like, let's say like a, a sequence of, of images or like a batch based on the, the recent sequence that it, of images that it's seen. In that case, the sampling that the robot is trying to, to use to feed into this layer is not gonna be randomized in the same way that maybe you were using random sampling during training. So now your, dis your distributions that you're gonna be normalizing here could also be affected by the sampling regime. Um, so both these reasons are are sort of breaking our current definition. So instead, what's done is we define batch normalization as keeping track of a running average of mean of means that were seen during during training and also standard deviations seen during training. And then at test time, we would apply these running averages for for normalizing new data that we see. And that would that would fix those two issues. So now we would have a, like a batch normalization layer that we could actually implement at test time that would perform the same on like on average normalization. It, like ignoring the fact that you're uh, at test time, your batches are going to be maybe sampled differently than they were during training, or that you might have batches of size one. Yeah. Yeah. So really great observation in that gamma and beta here are are a linear operation, <clears throat> and so that's actually one benefit of batch normalization in the way we've defined it is that because this is a linear operator you can actually implement you like if if uh let's say if our if the x here that we're getting is is output from a preceding layer you can actually embed or sort of like bake in gamma and beta with that preceding layers weights and for, for efficiency gains so essentially it's not like adding any additional computation um uh, but that's a great observation that this is a linear operator Yes. Yes. The so like the gamma and beta is 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 a linear like is a linear layer in the way we've seen it. But what what is different though is like in these calculations that where we're where we're calculating the mean and the and the standard deviation of this batch, that's fundamentally different than all the layers we've looked at up at this point because that is now going to be considering how data within your like across your batch dimension is related. So it's calculating this mean like across the batch, whereas all the other layers we've looked at have always treated the batch dimension as like all of the data along that dimension is independent. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, like also on this topic of how we would calculate these running averages, usually you'll use like a decay term during training. So you'll kind of accumulate uh, with some decay over time, the, like the running average and alternative implementation, like the original proposal for, for implementing batch, batch normalization was to actually take your entire training set once you want to apply this at test time and just directly calculate 
what the overall training set statistics are and use those training set, set st statistics for, for test time. But in practice, and which you could use, and it's pretty, and it is effective. In practice, more commonly, you'll see this running average accumulator implementation. Okay, and so as we as we mentioned from that observation, so this is a this is a linear operator, and so you can actually fuse this with the previous layer for efficiency gains. So you don't have actually any additional overhead costs in terms of computation during test time. Um, during training time, there's a little bit of, of overhead because you do have to calculate like the mini batch statistics, but it's a very small overhead compared to a like a convolution layer. Okay, so in addition, so one. Um, so in terms of like understanding, I guess, all, like in terms of the sizes, how batch normalization is being implemented. So in the case of a fully connected layer, which is the one we were looking at in that last slide, the, the statistics are being calculated over the batch dimension, just that N. So your, your, uh, your mean and your standard deviation are both gonna be vectors based on the dimension of your input. So this, they're gonna be one by D. And also the gamma and beta are gonna be one by D. In the case of convolutional networks for like image classification or, or object detection, where we have images coming as input, we actually take the, the statistics over both the batch dimension, but also the spatial dimensions. Um, and so we sort of treat these spatial dimensions as, as also being independent of one another for the purposes of calculating these statistics and performing the normalization. Um, so in terms of where these are usually inserted with the networks, so they're they're usually inserted after a fully connected layer or a convolutional layer and before nonlinearity, although there's a caveat there, which is you'll also sometimes see it inserted after the nonlinearity. Um, there's arguments for, for both, um, and usually it works equally well, no matter which, like, which order you implement it in. Um, but yeah. Uh, okay, so in terms of why is this beneficial? So we were mentioning that it makes it easier to sort of train or it makes optimization more efficient in terms of the, the number of training uh, steps that you need. And that's what's found in practice. So it makes deep neural networks like really like big emphasis here, much, much easier to train. Um, it allows generally speaking for higher learning rates. It usually makes parameter search a little bit easier um, because the convergence is faster. So you can do a wider search within your hyperparameter space. Um, the networks can sometimes become more robust to initialization because you're sampling mini batches for calculating those so those mini batch training statistics. It can also be a form of regularization, um, and so this this plot actually comes from the, from the original paper that proposed batch normalization, where this dashed line was training a network for I think it was image classification without batch normalization, and then this blue line up here is once they inserted batch normalization, controlling for the network architecture. Otherwise, and you can see it, it converges much faster in terms of the number of iterations here on the x-axis and then the error that it's converging to or the accuracy it's converging to on the on the y-axis. So that's the benefit. Well, you'll get much faster convergence with batch normalization. Question? Okay, so the question is with regards to like, what's the relationship between batch normalization and max pooling? Um, so in this slide, we have not, we don't have any max pooling happening on the, in this like network diagram here. Um, there's just batch normalization and then we have like these nonlinear activation functions. So I would say max pooling, the benefit of max pooling is different than batch normalization in that max pooling lets you, for one thing, increase the receptive field of your convolutional network faster. Um, and in addition, max pooling is nice because it can allow you to reduce how many features you have deeper in the network. So it allows you to kind of control where you're placing more computation or less computational resources within the network. Should you put max pooling after batch normalization? Usually that's what you'll see. Usually you'll see convolution, batch norm, relu. Uh, is it relu and then max pool, I think? Or... Sorry, yeah, max pull and then reload, right. That's usually what you'll see. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we have a question online. Could you explain why it could act as regularization? Yeah, so the regularization is because we're sort of introducing an additional source of random sampling during training. And the random sampling here is, um, well, it's not an additional source of random sampling. Let me correct that. We're still, we still have like the random sampling of mini batches that we had during stochastic gradient descent, but it's an additional source of potential noise within the network's uh, activations, like within the actual outputs of, of this batch neural layer based on the sampling that we were doing for our batches. So because these statistics, if I go back, because these statistics here are being calculated based on the batch, this mean here has a, is like another source of noise that's being injected into the network activations during training. And that, that noise is a form of regularization. Okay, so those are the benefits of, uh, those are some of the benefits of batch normalization. <clears throat> the downsides are first, like I was mentioning, there's not a concrete theory that explains why this works so effectively for, for increasing the convergence of, of our networks. Um, another <clears throat> big issue on the practical side is that because you're using different sources of data for the, for the mean and the standard deviations within the, norm the normalization, what that means is that during training time and testing time, the, the implementation of this layer has to act fundamentally differently, which is in contrast to convolution, right? For convolution, during training, you're still applying the same forward pass as you are at test time. There's no difference. For batch norm, you have to change out which mean and standard deviation vectors you're using. And so this can be a huge source of bugs that are really, really, really hard to find. Um, so beware of that when you go to implement batch normalization. Okay, so, so batch normalization is very effective for increase, for improving the convergence speed of our networks. We don't fully understand it. Uh, there are other forms of, of normalization that you'll see. So one, for example, that's used is called layer normalization. And so the idea for these other normalization techniques, we're not going to spend too much time on them because we don't see them as much for the types of for the types of kind of robotic perception tests that we're looking at. You see them in some other forms of like computer vision and other machine learning. Um, but what they're going to do is instead of normalizing along, along the batch dimension, they'll normalize along the other dimensions of your, of your feature vector. So layer normalization, instead, it's going to calculate <clears throat> what is the, for, for every batch element, it's going to calculate a separate mean just across all of the channels of your, of your vector for a fully connected network, and then use that as the, <clears throat> as the statistics during normalization. Your gamma and beta are still going to have to be independent of the batch dimension, just because you might train with different batch sizes. And so just in order to actually implement it, the, the dimension still has to be kind of ignorant of the batch size. Um, but sometimes we'll see these used in transformer architectures, which we'll talk about in a, in a few lectures. Um, so yeah, so layer normalization sometimes is used. Um, another one that's sometimes used, so this one, for example, is used like in the image, some of the image styling networks from computer vision. Um, again, instead of, instead of taking uh, a normalization across the batch dimension. It's just going to try and normalize across the spatial, the spatial dimensions. So you can kind of keep some distinct statistics for the specific elements in your batch. That's the high-level intuition there. There's a nice figure from this paper for actually visualizing how to think about the differences between these different normalization techniques. Um, and really, the core idea, like I was saying, is just to imagine that you're you're computing your statistics across different subsets of your possible dimensions of feature vectors. Um, there's another version called group normalization, but it's outside the scope of this lecture. Really, batch norm is the one that we're going to focus on and use. The others, for some niche applications, are, are relevant, but for our purposes in robot perception, we're generally going to see batch norm and less of the others. Okay, so, so that kind of caps off then these core components of convolutional neural networks that we've needed. So we have convolutional layers, pooling layers, fully connected layers, activation functions, and now a batch normalization layer. But we're left with this really big question about how we should combine these in a way to actually perform the, the types of perception tasks that we're interested in. And so to get some idea about how researchers in the past have looked at that, we're going to kind of step through some of the ImageNet uh, classification architectures that have won the ImageNet challenge and try to get some inspiration about how they potentially approach designing their networks and combining these different layers together. So the first one that we'll talk about is one that we've brought up, uh, I think, in a couple of past lectures and discussion section, which is AlexNet. So the ImageNet winner from, from 2012. Notably, it had a, a substantial dec decrease in the error rate on the classification problem from, from some of the earlier works in, in that area. And in addition, what, like the, the core um, 
kind of results or the core technique that they applied was by increasing the depth of their, of their neural networks. So back in 2012, the deep network was eight layers. Um, and so this eight layer network achieved state of the art on this image net classification task at the time. So in terms of what this network architecture looked like, so the input to the network were images. So RG color, red, green, blue channel images of spatial size, 227 pixels by 227 pixels. The overall network architecture then from the original paper is shown up here. So there were five convolutional layers. So each of these uh, kind of cubes along this horizontal span here is showing that different output from these five layers. So you had the output feature map from the first layer, the second convolutional layer, the third, the fourth, and then the fifth convolutional layer. Um, between each of those layers, you had max pooling and ReLU nonlinearity. And then at the very end, of, towards the end of the network, you had three final linear layers. So the final feature, uh, uh, let's see, the final feature volume was sort of flattened into a feature vector. And then you had one linear layer, two linear layers, three linear layers to your output 1,000 channels for the 1,000 classes in the ImageNet challenge. The back then, this was actually before batch normalization existed. So there was a different form of normalization used called local response normalization. That's not used anymore. So we're going to ignore that for the purpose of, of this discussion. And for training, one important detail is that um, they actually had to split training, even though, like in comparison to modern architectures, this is a very small network. They actually had to split training across two GPUs because at the time, the GPUs had, were, had limited memory of just three gigabytes per GPU. And so they actually couldn't even fit this full network on a single GPU at the time. So this is another thing we should appreciate, like sort of doing research and, and working now is we have a lot more access to compute power than they did. Um, yeah. So one kind of funny caveat, like the point of this slide is just to point out that actually there's like a sort of like typographic bug in the original AlexNet paper, which is that the figure is actually cut off. <laughs> so this is, this is really one of the most important papers in deep learning and even in machine learning more broadly, you could even maybe extend it to say computer science. And there's like the, it's it's going to be there for eternity. Like the figure is itself like cut off if you go and look at the original paper. Um, so sort of a funny like a funny like little caveat. So in terms of just how just how influential was AlexNet? Um, so like we said, so it was the it was the winner of the 2012 ImageNet Challenge. Um, that's one way you could potentially measure how how influential it is is on that benchmark. Another way that we would sometimes measure um, kind of productivity or the importance of work within science is by citation count. So it's how, how frequently have other papers cited this paper as a reference. And AlexNet is one of the most cited papers in the history of science. So it has more than 120,000 um, citations. And if you look at by year, right, so it's been around now for just a decade. So 12,000 citations per year, and you can see it's actually increasing how many citations it has per year. Um, it's, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, comparing that to some of the other notable papers within science, I mean, doing some of these comparisons and citation count is not a perfect measure by any means for how influential work is because every different field has different citation practices. We're looking at papers from like the 1800s on this slide. So very, very different um, like scientific communities obviously over time, but it's still an interesting concept to try and think about like where does Alex fit within within the efforts of science. So like Darwin's paper, for example, on the origin of species, actually that was not a paper. I think that was a, yeah, that was a book, I think. Um, but 60,000 citations, Shannon's A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which sets, which sets up the entire field of information theory, 140,000 citations. So Alex Nett's approaching. Um, Watson and Crick on the structure of DNA, 16,000 citations. So this just, just this really main only takeaway here is just Alex Net was very, very influential. It's one of the major discoveries of the past decade. Um, and within our field, it's like really one of the huge discoveries. Um, and so, so let's take a better look at how this was actually implemented. So the first thing we can do that's a valuable skill is to be able to make sure that we can sort of step through each of the layers of the, of the overall architecture and understand what was the input, how was the input transformed in terms of the, the size, and then also like some of the memory and compute um, footprint. So if we look at the first layer, so the first layer, once again, so it had three channels of input for the red, green, and blue color channels. It had a spatial resolution of 227 pixels. And the first layer was a convolutional layer. So what we had was a conv layer, like conv1, with 64 filters, um, a kernel size of 11 pixels. So that would be like the, the spatial resolution of the kernel was 11 by 11. A stride of four pixels, uh, two pixels of padding. So now let's try and think about how it is we can actually like derive what 
what is the number of output channels for this first layer? What's the spatial resolution of the output for this first layer? Um, so the first thing you'll recall is that the number of output filter, the number of output channels for a given convolutional layer is going to be the same as the number of filters that was used within that within that layer. So looking at our architecture, we have 64 filters. So the output number of channels is going to be 64. For the spatial resolution, it's a little bit more complex. You have to go back through, like, look at the equation that we had in the last lecture. You can derive what the output spatial resolution is. It's a good exercise to go through for yourself at home. But in this case, for the sake of time, we'll say it's the, the equations as shown on the on the slide here. So we have an output resolution of 56 pixels. So even after the first um, this first layer, it's downsampled spatially the image by quite a bit, right? So we went from 227 pixels down to like roughly a quarter of that along each the height and the width dimension, which is 56 pixels. One reason or like one like high level interpretation of how it went down so fast is because this stride was four pixels um, and with a pretty big kernel size of, of 11 pixels, like those two together factored into the equation is what explains that substantial reduction in spatial resolution. But kind of stepping through now, another useful thing to th start to think about is how much memory would actually be required to implement just this first layer. Um, so we can represent our amounts of memory in terms of bytes, or in this case, because of the size, we'll say kilobytes. And so the way to calculate the, the, no the amount of memory that's used by a specific layer is to take what's the number of elements in the output. So in this case, the number of elements in the output is going to be the number of output channels multiplied by the spatial resolution squared in this case, because it's the same along the height and the width. So we have 64 times 56 times 56 gives us roughly 200,000 output elements. And if we represent this with a 32-bit floating point number for each of these elements, we're going to have four bytes per element. So in total, we're going to end up with, down here you can see 784 kilobytes of, of memory for this one layer. Uh, in terms of the number of parameters, how can we calculate that? Well, if we take the number of channels of of output each of those is going to correspond to one filter and each of the filters is going to have the number of input channels multiplied by then its spatial resolution squared um, in order to get the, the total number of, of parameters right so we have 64 output channels so we're gonna have 64 filters and each of those filters then is going to be we can think about it as like a three-dimensional tensor of let's say three channels for the rgb multiplied by 11 pixels by 11 pixels for this spatial size of the kernel. Um, in addition, though, we shouldn't forget about the bias. So the bias is also going to be a vector of size 64 based on the six foot 64 output channels. So in total, if you add those two up, you'll get 23,000 parameters. Um, so not a very large number of parameters, but this is just one layer of the overall architecture. Another useful sort of thing to sort of think about is how much computation this is going to require, because in practice, obviously, we're going to always be bounded by what compute we have available on a robot. Um, so in this case, the way to do that is if we want to, let's say, count the number of floating point operations, where we'll, we'll call a floating point operation like a multiply add. So we'll say that those are fused together, because in hardware, in, on the computing side, you can fuse those two operations together. Um, the, and we'll, we'll describe this then in terms of millions of floating point operations. So, so to do this, what we'll do is we'll take every single output element that we have, which we calculated before is like roughly 200,000, and then try and understand how many operations are we going to have to perform to calculate just one of those output elements. So, so once again, so the total number of output elements is the output channel size by the output spatial resolution, so the height and the width of this output. And then to calculate each of those, right, it was each of those single elements was itself the results of a dot product between our kernel and then some portion of the of the image. So what we'll have, if you think about that dot product, is it's going to be one multiply add for every single element in our kernel. Um, so for every single element in our kernel, to calculate that, we'll take the numbers of channels of input multiplied by the spatial resolution of the kernel. Um, and so if you perform this, oops, perform this operation, you'll see it's in total 72 million uh, floating point operations so we'll say, let's say 73 with some rounding. Um, one thing that we're kind of ignoring in this calculation you might be wondering about is like the bias operations. Um, the reason the reason that we're not actually ignoring them, we're sort of factoring them into the math here, because if you think about the convolution, you can actually represent it. Let's say that if we have, uh, let's say that we need N operations for one of our dot products. So to, to, yeah, to perform one of our dot products, in reality, it's really n minus one because of the way that this accumulation is going to be implemented in hardware. So that leaves an additional n operations to add the bias elements. 
So in total, you'll end up with n total operations. Um, but yeah. Okay, so, so moving forward, so we, we've done the first layer. The next layer, like we were saying, there's a, there's a max pooling after each of the convolution layers. So for the max pooling, the first layer of, the first pooling layer of, of AlexNet is going to be a max pool with stride two and a kernel size of three. So if we want to calculate the output size, um, what we can do is we can, I think we had this equation also in the, in the last lecture, but um, essentially you're based on the specific kernel size for the max pool and then also the stride, you can directly calculate what the output spatial resolution will be. In this case, you're going from 56 to 27. And then the number of channels though is going to stay the same because this, the max pooling operation is applied channel by channel without changing the total number of channels. Um, in terms of memory, you can go through a similar calculation and just by calculating how many um, elements there's going to be in this output based on the change in the spatial resolution. And the nice thing though about pooling layers is that they have no learnable parameters like we talked about. It's just the, the max function locally. Um, and in terms of the uh, flops, that is a, okay, yeah, that's like a rounding. So there, there is math, there is floating point operations required for max pool. Um, it's essentially the number of, um, for, for every single output element, you're gonna have to do a max over the window size. So in this case of max pool, the window size is based on this kernel by kernel, because it's a 2D max pool. Um, so if we run through the math, you'll get 0 0.4 megaflops, which is relatively small compared to how many flops you, you saw we had for the convolution. All right, so one takeaway is, like we kind of talked about in last lecture, like max pools are very nice because they have no learnable parameters. So they're not adding complexity to our network in that way, but also they're very efficient in comparison to the convolution network, right? So they're gonna increase our receptive size and they're doing that for a, for a fairly cheap amount of compute. <clears throat> so working through the rest of the, of the network, we've given you, we've kind of stepped through it all here. I would say a good exercise to do at, at home is to actually like try working out this full table. Um, but for the sake of time, we won't step through the full table in lecture. Although I'll just point out that in the rest of the of the network architecture, there's just convolution and pooling layers up to this point. So all the math that we've seen can still can still be applied. Um, at the final output of your fifth pooling layer in AlexNet, so within the diagram, that's going to be at this portion, like the final output of the convolutional stage, is now going to be flattened into a vector. So at the very end of the, of the uh, max pool five, we had a spatial resolution now of six pixels and 256 channels. So in total, we had 256 times six times six numbers of elements there. And that gets flattened into just a vector of size 9,216. So that vector then is processed by a fully connected layer. And that fully connected layer, you can see in terms of like the number of parameters, it's gonna be based on the specific uh, like input dimension of 9,216 and then the output dimension of 4,096. So that's just a hyperparameter that was chosen for the for this hidden, hidden layer output size. Um, and then there's one final fully connected layer that takes you from 4,096 down to 1,000 elements. And the 1,000 is used as your final classification score for the 1,000 classes in the ImageNet challenge. So that overall, that is AlexNet. That's the 2012... AlexNet winner. So if you train this then with stochastic gradient descent, you would have a classifier that in 2012 was, was state of the art. One big question we should ask though, is like, there's a, there's a fair amount of hyperparameters baked into this architecture, right? So like there's the number of layers that they chose in AlexNet. For each of those layers, then there's the kernel size, there's the stride, the padding, and all of those are hyperparameters, right? So one question to ask is how did they choose these? Well, to some extent, they likely chose them based on the constraints that they had at the time, right? So we saw how just to fit this one this one architecture onto an actual GPU, they'd use two GPUs and split it across them. So one constraint obviously would have been the amount of compute they had available, right? That would have constrained how deep the network would have gone. But in addition, all these other hyperparameters like the numbers of channels, they could have shifted them around, right, slightly. Um, in reality though, that all of that hyperparameter tuning was, was trial and error. It was grad students with the two GPUs sitting and trying different combinations and trying to see what, what worked out well. Um, and I would say, at least from my experience, that still is the way that it goes. Um, I've heard like the term that actually I heard from Justin Johnson, who taught this course previously for computer vision, was instead of, uh, instead of stochastic gradient descent, it's like stochastic grad student descent. <laughs> it's like grad students trying to figure out what works well and what doesn't. Um, and I think to a large extent, that's that's true. Let's see, I think I saw a question or hand up. 
but maybe that went down. I thought it was funny too. So I don't recall how these authors did. I will say that distributed training is 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 itself actually an area of of research, and certainly on the engineering side, it's a big question because for for a number of reasons. There's also like this big topic in machine learning called federated learning, where you try and what they've kind of found actually that's interesting. I would say this might be sort of a source of regularization is. If you imagine taking the same architecture and multiplying it, so in, like I'll put it on a thousand different GPUs in maybe like a cluster, like a server farm, and we're going to train those 1,000 copies of our network on different batches of data. So now what you're going to have is like, because it's the same architecture, if you train each of them, let's say one time, like you do one forward pass and one backward pass on these 1,000 different mini batches, the gradients are all the same size. Like they're all the exact same shapes because it's the same architecture. So what you can do is you can actually recombine the gradients across those duplicated copies into one, one overall gradient and maybe update like a centralized weight matrix and then redistribute the updated weight matrix to all of your, and they've actually found that you can actually get better training result. You can actually get better accuracy with like with doing that. It's probably a source of regularization. Um, just goes to say that is a that is an area of like research, but also that like on the engineering side, that's a practical concern of like how do you do this distributed training? Um, yeah, if like there's a paper, like it has a great name, so it sticks in my mind called Hog Wild Training. Um, and that's essentially what they do. Um, I don't remember how these authors did it if they split like the first half onto one GPU and the second half or at every layer, if they split it like vertically across the channels or something. But I think if we went back to the paper, we could find out. Okay. So, yeah, so a lot of trial and error for hyperparameter tuning. And there's some interesting kind of trends. Uh, within the, within the like, side within like the kind of memory footprint and the compute footprint that we're seeing across these different layers, right? In particular, one thing that we kind of uh, skipped over for the sake of time, but you'll actually notice that these final fully connected layers are have the most number of parameters across this network. Um, so despite the fact that um, convolution, on the other hand, is very expensive computationally. It's relatively cheap in terms of the number of parameters, right? So the convolutional was 73 flops initially in the first portion of the network. And even the most expensive fully connected layer here is only is about half of that in terms of the compute. On the number of parameters, on the other hand, there's, what is it, two orders of magnitude, at least increase in the number of parameters for the fully connected versus the first convolution. So there's an interesting trend. So we, if we try and look at that in a little bit more detail, what we can see is that for AlexNet, most of the memory usage comes in the early portions of the network. Um, so in other words, most of the memory that's required for actually outputting those feature tensors comes early on. And to some extent that makes sense, right? Because early on the spatial resolution of those feature tensors is still pretty big. It hasn't gone through the, the max pooling to really, to really um, kind of narrow it down. On the other hand, the number of parameters, like we saw is, this is actually like, you know, to some extent surprising are, are really the highest for these final fully connected layers, like the very end of the network. The reason why is because fully connected layers, right, they have that kind of global view of their input, whereas convolution layers, and so correspondingly, because they have that, because fully connected layers have that global view of the input, they need one parameter sort of for every pixel in their input. So again, like these fully connected layers are taking as input the, the feature tensors. They're not looking at the original input image, but still they need one parameter for every pixel of kind of input. The convolution, on the other hand, they because their their parameters are based on that like small kernel. They don't, they're not actually like looking at the full input for their specific uh, portion of the network. And so that sort of explains why the, the number of parameters for these convolution layers is much smaller. Um, and then in terms of flowing point operations, like the actual amount of compute that's used, it's relatively consistent across the convolution layers. Uh, and then it drops off drastically towards the end for the, um, for the fully connected. So there's this kind of interesting duality, right? Where the, like the fully connected use the, few, like the smallest amount of compute, but have the most parameters. Um, and then conversely, the convolution use more compute, but have fewer parameters. So that gets us up to 2012, right? That's kind of like the starting point of when the these trends that we're going to start to look at now in the development of CNN architectures was really just starting. So following that, then in 2013, uh, the accuracy on ImageNet was improved even further. So the winner in that case was got it down to 11.7. Uh, 
percent error rate. And in this case, it was once again a CNN architecture that still had eight layers. Uh, this was called ZFNet. Um, and really, at a high level, this was just a bigger AlexNet. So architecturally, there's not too much interesting here other than like there were a few changes that was mostly based on increasing the number of channels. So in the convolute in the like third, fourth, and fifth convolutional layers, they increased from 384 channels to 512, 384 to, to 1024, and 256 to 512. Um, but otherwise, the architecture is mostly the same. So ZFNet, like there's not too much noteworthy other than they, they increased the number of, of filters that were used within the network. Um, and correspondingly got like a pretty substantial relative change in the error rate. But again, in terms of picking out like which, how they made these changes, it was still trial and error. Um, so there's, that one is less kind of interesting. There's less noteworthy there. 2014, on the other hand, um, brings about what's called VGG network. That name comes from the, from the group that they were in. Um, and this one is really interesting. So for one thing, the number of layers in VGG is now a substantial increase. So they were more than doubling the amount of layers, which at the time was very noteworthy because what was being found in practice was that training these, these networks of increasing depth was really hard, right? Because it's worth remembering at this point, we're still, we're still before Bash Norm. So Bash Norm comes out in 2014, and I think it still comes out, I wanna say after VGG, um, but like I think it comes out sort of soon after VGG came out. So, so the, at the time, like the thinking was like, these are very, very deep networks. I mean, nowadays you'll see networks in the hundreds of layers. So like we've, we've improved since then, but bash norm obviously is, has a lot of, to do with the reason for why we've seen deeper networks. Um, so let's take a look at VGG because there's a number of things that are noteworthy here. So one principle behind VGG that was proposed is instead of trying to have these different layers where the hyperparameters can sort of be kind of roughly anything, right? We're just gonna like kind of trial and error across all these different hyperparameters in the, in the different layers. VGG proposed instead to sort of set up a core um, like pair of design rules and then only tune hyperparameters that would fit within these design rules. So the, the two design rules that they have are, I guess three, are to have first all convolution layers can, are constrained to a three by three kernel size where you have a stride of one and padding of one. The second is that all max pool layers are have a two by two kernel size and a stride of two. And then after you do a max pool, you'll always double the number of, of channels within the, uh, within the output at the next convolution layer that would follow that max pool. And so we'll look at what the benefit was, is of, of these kind of design rules and why they made some intuit, like intuitive sense. And then, um, yeah. So in terms of the, the overall the network design, so VGG has five convolutional stages where in stage one, you go from, like there's two convolutions followed by a max pool. Stage two has two convolutions followed by a max pool. Stage three has two convolutions followed by a max pool. And then in stage four, there's either three convolutions followed by a max pool or four convolutions followed by a max pool, depending on which variant of VGG you are. So within this paper, within the original VGG paper, I think they proposed, I think it's five variants of VGG, where the variations are the number of, of layers. So VGG 16, has 16 layers that have learnable parameters within them. VGG19, which was the largest of the proposed models from this paper, has 19 layers with learnable parameters. So they're not counting the max pool layers, the softmax layer, the input layer. And then for the sake of, of room on this slide, if you count up the learnable parameters here, you'll see that there's not actually 19. So we're ignoring that um, in these earlier layers, I think it was, this layer and this layer, there's actually three convolutions. But um, by the main takeaway, so for VGG16, there's 16 layers of learnable parameters, and VGG19, there's 19 learnable, not 19 layers of with learnable parameters. Um, so okay, so why did they sort of pick these design rules? Was there intuition behind these design rules? There was. So so looking at the first one, trying to think about why we would want maybe all convolutional layers to have a three by three kernel size and a stride of one. Uh, let's consider uh, let's consider two cases. Let's say one case where we have a convolutional layer with a five by five kernel size, and then a second case where we have two convolutional layers followed in sequence, where, where both of those have a three by three kernel size. And let's see what happens in terms of the number of parameters that our network has to learn, and also how much compute our network is going to have to do. So in the first scenario, if we have a five by five kernel size, 
the number of parameters is going to be five times five times the numbers of channels of input times the number of channels of output, right? So in total, that's going to be five times five times, let's say, C channels of input and C channels of output. So we're going to have 25 C squared total parameters that we have to learn. If we look on the, on the second option where we're going to follow, let's say, the VGG design principles, we'll see that, okay, for uh, in, terms of, in terms of the number of parameters, we're going to have for the first layer, it's three times three, so nine times C times C, so nine C squared. And then we're going to add to it, so not multiply, but add a second three times three times C times C. So in total, we're going to have 18 C squared parameters. So already, so one, one difference in these two different schemes is we have less parameters that we need to learn, right? We have, instead of 25 C squared, we have 18 C squared. So our network is smaller in terms of memory or in terms of uh, parameters. It's likely going to be smaller than in terms of floating point operations. So if we run, if we run through the floating point operation cal calculation, so the way to do that is to take um, every single element of output that you have and multiply it by how many um, operations you had. So in this case, what we have is we're going to have height times width times channel output elements, let's say. So we have channels of output, and then let's say we have some spatial resolution that's height times width. So you can take C times H times W, and then you're going to multiply it by C times 5 times 5 because you have that inner product for each one of those output elements. And for that inner product, right, when we were doing that floating point operation, we saw that one inner product requires essentially like the number of elements in your kernel that you're, that you're doing the inner product over. So 25 C squared H times W floating point operations for the first option. And then the second option, it's the same idea, except instead of, so what we're going to do now is we're still going to have like the same spatial output resolution. And I'll get to how it is we know that in a second. Um, but for each of those now, we have fewer operations that are actually required. So it's the same kind of math in terms of the number of parameters. It's going to be 18 C times C times H times W. Um, so the, the reason why the spatial output is going to be the same is because actually the receptive field for this second option where you have two three by three convolutions is also five by five. So if you, it, it helps for me to like kind of draw it out, but if you, you can also use like the equations we had in the last lecture. So if you imagine like a three by three window, um, and then you imagine sort of propagating that to a second layer with the three by three window, you'll find that actually the receptive field in this option two is also five by five. So because of that, we know that our spatial output resolution is gonna be the same as our spatial output resolution in the first option. And, um, but we have this benefit of having fewer floating point operations needed to get the same spatial resolution. So intuitively, that's, that's part of the thinking, I think, that went into this, this first design principle. It's that we can kind of get a nice uh, small number of parameters and a fewer floating point operations with two sequential three by three convolutions than we would get with a five by five or an even larger uh, kernel sized convolution where we only have one of them. Question. So caveat to that. So, so the question was um, in option one, we have more parameters. So presumably it will sort of take longer to train. Um, but in option one, we also have more floating point operations. Like option one is both kind of, uh, hypothetically harder to train because we have more parameters. And also each training step will take longer. The, the floating point operations in option one is larger. 25 C squared HW is larger than 18 C squared HW. So, the, so, the, so in other words, so to kind of encapsulate, the benefits of option two are same receptive field as output as option one. Fewer parameters, so hopefully training is a little bit easier, and fewer floating point operations, so training is also faster. The kernel size in option two is is smaller, um, and so yes, so so oh yeah, and that's actually another benefit is if you were to add, let's say, a nonlinearity between these. Then you're also baking in more nonlinearity in option two than you would be in option one. In option one, you have maybe only one 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 place where you could put a nonlinear a nonlinear out, uh, function, which is at the very output. In option two, you could put one intermediate, like within in between these two layers, and also at the output. 
Yes, the question was, we always have to take into consideration the, the parameters and the receptive field when designing a neural network. That's true, yes. Uh, was this before or after the introduction of one by one convolution? I think that this was after one by one convolution. Yeah, because if I'm remembering, I think that networks and network paper was, eh, it was right around this, I think it was like 2014, I think the networks and networks, which is before BGG, but we'll see the one by one come up, I think in the next architecture that we look at. Um, so, so to summarize, so two three by three convolutions has the same receptive field as a single five by five. And we have fewer parameters and also less computation and more nonlinearity. Okay, so moving on. So Alex, so like comparing AlexNet to VGG16, the one big difference is that VGG16 is overall <clears throat> much bigger. It's much bigger in terms of the memory that was needed for each of the layers. It's much bigger in terms of the number of parameters and also then the, the total amount of compute that was used. Um, so like looking at in terms of in terms of memory, there's a 25 times increase from AlexNet to VGG16. There's a 2.3 times increase in the number of parameters and a 20 times increase in the number of compute needed. So that gets us up to 2014. Um, VGG 16 though, it turns out, and VGG 19 actually did not win ImageNet in 2014. Instead, what we had was GoogleNet winning in 2014, um, where GoogleNet was on the same order of the total number of layers. So in VGG 19 was 19 layers. GoogleNet has 22 layers. Um, and you could see it sort of edged out by less than 1% in error rate. Um, and the main focus of GoogleNet in contrast to VGG 16 and 19 was a real focus on, on efficiency, so compute efficiency. Um, so at the time, Google was sort of envisioning trying to have these networks deployed on mobile devices like phones or maybe robots. Um, and so they wanted to try and squeeze out as much compute efficiency as possible for the same um, error rate. Uh, and so that was really like the high level focus of the, the innovations in this paper. So what they tried to do was reduce the total parameter count, reduce the total memory usage, and also reduce the, the compute. So how did they do this? So the first thing that, that they did that was an innovation was they introduced down in this. So, so this, this layer is describing from the input being down at the bottom to the final output classification at the very top. And so the, the input down in this portion first passes through what's called a STEM network. And this STEM network's purpose was to try and downsample very, very rapidly the spatial resolution of the, of the uh, input. And so working through how it does this, so this is, these are the specific layers that are used within the STEM portion of GoogleNet. So it started out with a convolution, a two by, like a 2D convolution. We had a kernel size of, two, of, of seven and a stride of two, followed by a max pool operation with the kernel size of three, a stride of two. And then you had um, like another 2D, two 2D convolutions, uh, where first you had a one by one convolution, uh, which changed the number of, let's see, that one actually kept the number of filters the same, 64 input, 64 output. Um, but then in the next layer, you have another two by two convolution with a kernel size of three, which increases the number of features using 192 filters. Um, and then followed by one more max pool. So the main um, reduction here, you can see as we go just in these first, let's say three convolution layers plus two max pooling layers, you go from an input size of 224 pixels now to an output size in the spatial dimensions of 28 pixels. So almost an order of magnitude reduction in the spatial resolution, just in the STEM portion of the network. So comparing this STEM portion of GoogleNet with VGG16, and in this case, this comparison is based on the same portion of VGG16. So it's like looking up to the first three convolution layers of VGG16. There's uh, a, like VGG16 has like roughly six times as much memory consumption 
10 times as many parameters and about 20 times as much compute. Um, so there's like a, a huge reduction in spatial resolution and for a very cheap amount of memory parameters and compute. Um, obviously that probably comes at some cost for, for representation power, but, but their goal again was to try and maximize efficiency. So trying to get rid of as many of those um, spatial pixels as possible was their, was the intention of this portion of the network. From that point on then, they took some uh, kind of, they took this, this idea of like an inception module is what they called it. And they then sort of chained these together to form the rest of the network. So within an inception model, module, what you have is a set then of convolution layers that are kind of operating in parallel. So what you do is you take the input that you might have from, from a preceding layer, you'll feed it through a one by one convolution, you'll feed it, th feed it through a, a sequence of one by one, three by three, one by one, three by three, and then a three by three maximal and a one by one convolution. There's not too much intuition that I think we can really take away from how they came up with this like in parallel sequence of one by one and three by three convolutions. Um, but, but notably then they all then come back together um, at the end through like an element wise addition. So the output shape here between these different like four parallel channels has to, has to be the same. Um, and so in part, some of these one by one convolutions would be used to achieve that similar to what we talked about in last lecture. So this, this structure then, this local structure of an inception module is then repeated throughout the rest of the, of the network. Um, yeah, so these one by one networks, they're, they're sort of like these one by one convolutions, they're sort of bottleneck is what they're referred to layers where they can reduce the channel dimension to ensure that the, um, that the output sizes match up for the, for the accumulation operation at the end. So looking then at the very end, so where the classification scores are finally made at the very end of, of Google Net, um, one notable difference between Google Net and the, the architectures we've looked at up to this point is they use what was called global average pooling. So global average pooling is similar to max pooling, but instead of a max operation over the spatial dimensions, you're going to do just an average. The main takeaway is that at the very end of, of Google Net, what they have is a global average pooling operation, which is going to average over the final spatial pixels that you have from the output of the last inception layer, which is distinct from the preceding architecture we've looked at, which used a, like a max pooling layer at the very end of the, of the architecture. One other detail about Google Net is that they tried to incorporate additional training signal by having these classification heads at earlier stages of the network. So what they would do at two portions earlier within the network is they would take the output feature tensor that they get and try and have a classification decision made using these intermediate kind of earlier features. And so the idea with that is that um, Google Net was deeper, right? So it had 22 total layers. And back then training with these networks, this was still um, uh, just before batch normalization was actually used. So training these deeper networks was very difficult. And so trying to incorporate this additional training loss, this sort of feedback signal, uh, was, was what the intuition behind adding these, these additional loss terms was. Sometimes you'll, you'll still see this where some networks will still have like losses defined using some earlier, uh, tensor from the network, but more recently, you generally don't see this used as much as you would sort of in like five years ago. Okay. So that gets us to 2014. So there's Google Net, So the winner of the 2014 ImageNet challenge, um, and then since then, ResNet has been sort of further improved. So in 2015, just one year later, there was an order of magnitude, almost two orders of magnitude. No, yeah, one order of magnitude increased in the number of layers that, that were used. So ResNet used 152 total layers, which at the time was like a dramatic, dramatic increase. Um, and so we should look at how it was that they, that they achieved this. The first thing is, so at this point, it's worth pointing out, this is now with batch normalization. So batch normalization could, could now be used. Um, and looking at the time, I'm actually running out of time. So we'll do this briefly at the start of next lecture, looking at ResNet. Um, ResNet, I'll just point out as sort of a highlight for what to look forward to in that lecture, is still used. So generally what you'll see now used commonly is ResNet as a backbone to the architectures that you'll be using on your robots. So you sort of take the ResNet as like a feature extractor that's trained on ImageNet and then fine tune it on whatever task you're trying to actually implement in practice. Um, so in terms of how ResNet was so successful in the past, we'll, we'll cover that in next lecture.